Matt Jacobson is the head of market development at Facebook. Aside from founder Mark Zuckerberg, Matt is Facebook's longest serving employee. As the public face of the company, Matt always has a great sense of fashion, and he connects Silicon Valley and Hollywood in building meaningful partnerships to advance Facebook's development. Now, please join me in welcoming Matt Jacobson, employee number eight and head of market development at Facebook, and moderator Benjamin Morris, advisor to BSCF 2019 and director at Evolve Network. Well, thank you very much, Matt, for, for being here today. Uh, for those of you who don't, don't know yet, so Matt is based in LA and he flew specially uh, for this conference here. So uh, we're very, very fortunate to have him here today. And uh, thank you guys as well for being here. So, yes, ah, there. let's see, is the mic on? Otherwise I will give you my mic. Let's get another one. There's another one. That's what you got. It was on there. Now. We go. Perfect. I had to turn it on. All right. So, so Matt, maybe as a way of introduction, could you tell us a bit about your experience and also how you came to join Facebook as employee number eight? So, I, I met Mark Zuckerberg in the spring of 2005. I had sold a small company that I had had, and it would it kind of gave me some freedom to to look at other things to do. It didn't mean I was not going to work again, but I just had you know freedom. And I met Mark through a mutual friend and kind of asked him what it was he wanted to do. And he said he, you know, his goal was to build tools to make the world more open and connected. And I thought, well, that's, you know, I, I like that. You know, he was very focused on being a mission-driven company and that mission appealed to me. Um, and the core values that we ultimately created are the core values that existed today. And so I just took a, you know, I, I believed in him. I believed in the mission. Um, he was very clear with me that we were either going to do something that was going to change the world or we were going to, you know, go down guns blazing and it was going to be over quickly, which those two things were very, I either wanted to be some part of something that was going to be very successful and it be impactful or it was going to be over if it wasn't going to happen. Because a lot of companies around that time, um, you know, existed but weren't really moving forward in any meaningful way and so I just didn't want to be part of that. So. And so what did you, what were you kind of, what did you join Facebook for and how has your job evolved over time? So I, when I first, I was really one of the first non-engineering hires in the company. And so, you know, there was kind of eight of us in a small room in, in Palo Alto. And the, the job at hand was to figure out what was the business model going to be. And so, you know, it was, you know, Mark was very focused on building the tech and the platform that you know, was the social network, and the company hadn't been fully funded at that time, and and so I I live in Southern California. I grew up in Southern California. I'm a surfer, and I live in the town I grew up in. And I had ten year old daughters, twin daughters at the time, and I wasn't going to move to Northern California. So I told Mark, I said, you know, he's like, you know, God, your resume's long. I don't know how we're going to pay you. And I said, you know, that's what happens when you're old, and you know, you're You've done a lot of stuff, and I said, you know, I'm not, I'm not really interested in moving to Northern California. So I said, don't pay me. I will just do this for equity, and we'll try it for six months, and we'll know in six weeks whether it's going to work or not. So there's no pressure on you, no pressure on me. And it wasn't that I was so cunning, right, that I had this grand vision of, you know, the equity being as valuable as it became. But it was really more around, okay, just let's just see what the business is. Let's see if we can develop the, the business here. And so that's how it started and made a couple of deals. And I'd never sold ads before. That wasn't my you know, experience. But I said, okay, I'm going to find good partnerships. And we made a couple of good partnership deals in those early days. And that was 14 and a half years ago. And what do you find most exciting about what you do at Facebook? So now, I mean, I made up my title, so this is a good lesson to you as you begin your careers. Mark asked me what I wanted to be called, you know, what my title was gonna be. So I made up my title, which at the time was head of market development, which doesn't mean anything, but it sounds like business development, it sounds like marketing. And I thought it'd be much easier to get meetings than saying you're running sales. 
right? So now I've added market and culture development because I'm now kind of heading up all of our kind of culture work, which we should talk about a little bit, you know, at Facebook. But, um, you know, it's, you know, again, at the time it was finding those kind of good partners, you know, that we want to work with. And my, you know, I was also, because I had run big organizations in the past, this is also a good lesson for you, you know, early career. Um, I was very clear with Mark that I didn't really care about managing people. That, you know, I was much more interested. He goes, well, what is it you really want to do? And I said, I want to be that guy, you know, on that little rubber Zodiac out in front of the mothership looking for new land. And, you know, I, I want to be perceived as a leader. And I think there's, been, there's a difference between leadership and management. And I said, my best work is done mentoring as a leader, kind of looking for new opportunities for us, um, not running dashboards and managing big teams. That's not the stuff I really want to do. And I've been very fortunate that other than um, a couple of people for the first, you know, 10 years of the company, I managed Mark's sister, Randy worked for me, and Naomi Glight, who's joined the company right after, they worked for me briefly. And then I ran a big team after the Instagram acquisition, and now I'm back to having a very small team again. So, you know, again, they're the, one of the one of the great things about the tech economy and kind of the world right now is that individual contribution is as valued as management. Can you tell us a little bit more about the cultural work that you do and the, the initiatives you lead? Yeah, so I think that you know our core values around being bold, making impact, moving fast social good are very consistent with the original core values that I worked on at the company when I first joined. And Matt Kohler, who's now a very successful venture capitalist here, and, and I and worked on our original core values around humble partnership, honesty, empathy, transparency, and trust, um, which are very similar to what they are today. And so putting context around our core values, around being bold, making impact, moving fast, social good, I think is important. So, you know, those are not terms of art that a young, that a young, you know, new employee or a young early career employee understands, but all of those come with trade-offs. So I see this through my, I have a 25 year old daughter who now works at Facebook. And I saw when she joined, and she grew up with these values, because we obviously something we talked about and Facebook was a big part of our lives. But, you know, the idea of being bold and making impact and moving fast, without context around them doesn't make sense. I mean, those are not, you know, you can do, you can make a lot of wrong moves without understanding what those values mean. So as we hire a lot of people in the company, you know, putting the context around those values I think really matters. You know, ideas around leadership as opposed to management, what it means to be part of successful teams, how you can contribute. I mean, I've had, you know, I've, when I ran teams and even today, I mean, my daily meditation for myself is around being the best part of another person's day. I mean, that's kind of the, that's kind of my guiding, you know, light on a daily basis. I had an entire team of, you know, 40 people whose main KPI for the first two years was being the best part of their cross-functional partner's day. So, so that's a, a really fascinating point and something we don't really see much in the, in the corporate world. How do you kind of embody that and make that a KPI, both, I guess, in your personal life and also in people that you, that you lead? I mean, I think a lot of it comes from experience. And like I, I will tell you, as you guys you know, think about your careers and begin your careers, that it's a really good time to enter the workforce because I... I think the era of bullies and assholes is over, you know, to a great extent in business. And I worked for some really, I mean, working in Hollywood, you know, when I started in the business, I had some, you know, I had some rough bosses and, I, and it was a rough business. And people put up with behavior that's completely unacceptable today. So the fact that people choose their leaders, the fact that people don't, you know, allow themselves to be treated in ways that people were allowed to be treated in the past, I think is a really positive thing. And for me, you know, again, I think that, you know, one of the great lessons I've learned that if things don't feel right, you know, I don't push them. I used to think early in my career when I got out of school that like, 
you can't outsmart me, you can't outwork me, and I can like get this done. Like I'm just, through sheer force, I'm gonna get it done. And I didn't realize that when things don't feel right, they're just not worth, they're probably not worth doing. And so that's something that I've tried to really work with, with teams and employees at Facebook to understand that, you know, it's okay to say no. You know, if things don't feel right, you know, it, it's okay to speak up. You know, one of our, we're a, a big poster culture. And one of my favorite posters is what would you do if you weren't afraid? And one of the things that I, you know, say is, listen, I don't, when there's behavior that, when I see behavior that's out of, you know, bounds from our core values or inconsistent with our values, I call it out and I encourage others to do so. That's actually one of my favorite quotes and I have it in my room, so it's a, it's a really inspiring quote. Taking a step back from, from that, um, uh, talking a little bit about the industry and the market since you're head of market development, um, we see that kind of the, the lines between uh, media, uh, you know, content and, and tech blurring. So with some Hollywood studios uh, having, uh, you know, startup incubators and also tech companies moving more into the content space, how do you see that and, and what trends do you kind of see in that space? I think there's a real, we talked about this earlier today, I think there's real differences between Hollywood culture and Silicon Valley culture. I mean, these, these two worlds are 400 miles apart. This is not that, you know, there's not this huge chasm, right? They're really kind of the same people. But the creative process in Hollywood is a very different process. The development process, you know, for creating, you know, kind of platforms and systems is completely different in Silicon Valley. I think this idea of project management, being a PM, you know, is a skill that for, to a great extent, doesn't exist in LA. And I think it holds back, it holds LA-based companies back. Because attracting good project management skills to Southern California is not easy. And it's very hard to build a successful business without project management skills. On the other hand, Silicon Valley believes that the entertainment industry is incredibly rational. Um, the entertainment industry is not rational. The, I, the difference between a good movie, a good television show, and a bad one are very, very slight tweaks. So, and these are huge cultural differences. And again, I think that to some extent, Silicon Valley, it's better now, trivialized what the creative process was and how to find it. It was gonna be all algorithm based. That doesn't really work. You see how hard it's been for Netflix to get to a point to surface content that's relevant, right? And you know, once that algorithm is wrong, you should see this with Pandora, right? You'd have 27 songs in a row that kind of felt right, and then there's one that isn't, and then you never trust the algorithm again. And I think that there's now a better appreciation for what the creative process is, and I think that Hollywood is understanding the distribution from the important platforms, whether it's us or Google or you know, others are, are incredibly meaningful. Kind of following up on that, what do you think has changed the most over the course of your career in both on the media side and in the tech space? You know, I think that there's a great, there's a much better, when I, when I joined Facebook, that was considered very rare that someone from, you know, traditional entertainment background would move to work at a tech company, would do that for no salary, you know, would work for somebody, you know, that was less than half my age. I mean, it was funny, because the number one question I would get from people in Hollywood who I had worked with for a long time was, how can you work for somebody that young? What's it like? And, I, you know, I, and I'm not ageist, so I never thought about Mark as why, I, you know, I never rank people based on how old they are. It's a, you know, I, it's a meritocracy with me, right? And so I think that people would never think that way. You know, when you say that about Mark today, you know, and at the other time, it was like, yes, and Hollywood is a place where you've got, you know, the incentive structure is completely different. It's based on big salaries, and, and people come in, and, you know, there's, you, you work your way up to a big salary, or you have, you know, expertise that is, you know, perceived expertise or real expertise that comes from tenure. And it's, not, it's a much different um, kind of point of view from a compensation standpoint and from an incentive standpoint. Um, the Silicon Valley was. I think those things are now changing. And what are some of the bad recommendations that you hear in your area of expertise or your areas of expertise? You know, I think that 
you know, I, again, I, I feel like that right now, in spite of everything kind of going on in the world and like an economy that feels fragile, you know, globally, that it's a really good time to enter the workforce, right? That a lot of the things that, you know, again, that, you know, made it difficult, you know, lousy jobs, early career, you know, working for people who you didn't like or respect, putting up a treatment that you, you know, you knew was wrong, but like that was the price you played. I mean, one of my very first meetings at my, my first movie studio jobs, the head of the studio picked up a fax machine and threw it at somebody else in the meeting. And that was, you know, outrageous, but considered kind of acceptable behavior. It's very funny, I'm not gonna tell you who it is, but I uh, had dinner with him a year ago and his wife was saying, oh, tell me, what was it like, you know, working for him? And I said, I'm gonna tell you a story. And, you know, that's when fax machines were big and they mattered, right? You know, they weren't like $79 at CVS. They were like, it was like a big hunk of equipment and there was like one of them. So like to pick that thing up and throw it at somebody was, you know, um, had consequences. Um, quick show of hand in, in the audience, who here considers himself or herself as a t more technical background? All right, great. And so I guess the other half would be, um, would be non-technical. Less technical. Yes, less technical, exactly. Um, what would be some of your advice to people with a less technical background who would like to work in a, in a tech company? Well, I mean, so the, the good thing now is that I think there's very few, there, there still exists, but, but there's, you know, tech companies as, you know, tool providers is a small slice of what it used to be, right? These are now companies that happen to use technology as their basic platform. You know, Be you know, Jeff Bezos created a company on Amazon that was a tech platform. It's now just an amazing company that happens to use, you know, technology to kind of empower what they do. Netflix, same thing. I mean, do you, how many of you remember when Netflix used to send out DVDs, right? So, I mean, you think of what Netflix has evolved from. And I had a friend who went to Netflix as a head of ad sales whose job it was to sell an insert in that envelope. Right, and think how different that business has become. I mean, Netflix is in the same distribution, about being in the distribution business, they were in the distribution business of DVDs, it was just done in your mailbox. So I think that, you know, having good broad experience, I think being, you know, you know, having a broad understanding of the way the world is, understanding other cultures, having a good kind of cultural context for things, you know, those are the kind of things I look for when hiring somebody. I'm, I'm not hiring, engineers, but when I'm looking to bring people into the org and we have a very rigorous interview process at Facebook, you know, I'm looking for people who can bring something to the company that it's value and I feel is going to be a good teammate that's yeah. going to understand and embody our core values and, you know, is somebody who's going to fit. So kind of having this, this broader understanding of the, the market and the world in general. Um, Moving on into maybe more personal questions, um, how has a failure or a parent failure in your life set you up for a later success? You know, I, I've been very blessed. Like I haven't had, like my career has been, you know, again, this was, joining Facebook was a, a blessing. I wasn't, you know, super, you know, I wasn't looking for it. I met an interesting guy in Mark Zuckerberg through a mutual friend. And I thought, wow, this is like, this is worth, this is worth me committing my time and effort to see if we can make something meaningful here. I haven't really been involved in things that have been like, you know, colossal failures. I've, you know, I have, I have, you know, I think I've made bad decisions. I think I've learned, you know, again, not trying to push things that didn't feel right. You know, I, um, which I don't talk about a lot, but I'm a, I'm a pancreatic cancer survivor. So that's given me, a, and that was just 13 years ago, and I'm healthy now, I'm kind of knock wood. But, um, you know, that was a huge, you know, that gave, that was a huge change in perspective for me. And I'm, I was really lucky in that I, I had a much different perspective about life and work and the things that were important to me before I was sick. Um, because if I hadn't, it would have been a very, very, you know, hard pivot for me. So, like, there was, there was some divine um, intervention that, that made me think about things differently than I had, you know, that I, that I had, I I told you, like, in, in Hollywood, um, early in my career, a guy told me, he said, in Hollywood, you don't hope for your friends to fail, you hope for your friends to die, and, um, and it's kind of was true, right, it was just, and 
I said, you know, I, I was kind of living that way. I used to, there's other good advice I'll share with you. I used to always, I just, and some of you, you, you probably won't want to admit it, but I used to always expect the worst and then be pleasantly surprised when that didn't happen. And that's a really terrible way to live. And so 20 years ago, I said, you know, I can't live like this. Like, I just, that's not cool. That's not who I want to be. That's not the kind of person I want to be or the kind of father I want to be. And so I stopped doing that. And that was a really good decision. Kind of bouncing on that, what in the last, it can be in the last few years, in the last decade, what is one or two new beliefs or, or thoughts that you've had that have significantly improved the quality of your life? You know, I, I'm a practicing Buddhist, and so I believe there's a couple of key things that I think about, you know, that are kind of part of my practice. This idea of self-grasping ignorance, you know, which is not, thing like basically not looking at the world from your own belly button, you know, all the time, and trying to be empathetic and look at the world from somebody else's point of view. And um, it's also this idea, there's a very kind of, a story, you know, in, in the practice around the idea of you come out in the morning to turn your car on and the battery's dead and it won't start and you can make a decision then that that, you know, that's going to become your problem or you can kind of make that, that's the car's problem. So, like, you know, I, you know, so I, to use it like in very basic terms, like, you know what, if the battery's dead, that's the car's problem, I'm going to figure something else out. I could choose to internalize that, oh my God, it's, you know, terrible, what's it going to do, it's going to screw up my day, I'm not going to make it to the meeting. You know, it kind of is what it is. So, that, and then idea of patient acceptance, of just being a better, you know, trying to be the best part of another person's day, to try to be more understanding, to be a better listener, to be a better partner, you know, and I think our core values around, you know, empathy, honesty, trust, transparency, are the kind of things that make you a better father, you know, son, you know, boss, employee. And uh, it, it might be maybe a bit, a bit difficult to talk about, but what are some of the lessons that you've learned from being a, a cancer survivor and anything that you'd like to share with the audience? No, I mean, listen, I, you know, again, I, uh, you know, I'm, I, 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 I had a great career before I joined Facebook. My life was great. You know, I kind of wanted, you know, I, I listen, I, this has been a, a real amazing kind of you know, last 15 years for me, but I was pretty stoked before I joined Facebook, you know, and, you know, it's, it's only now, I think one of the big, again, I don't want to go too deep, I really don't talk about the, the, the my health, but, you know, I, I didn't talk about it. I didn't tell anybody I was sick. Mark knew, um, a couple other people knew, but I generally didn't talk about it, and I kind of went it alone, and I think that was a mistake, and so, I now have like become, you know, I, I do talk about it a little bit and I encourage people who are, you know, again, I was wrong because I believe, I, you know, I, I, generationally, I believe that when you kind of show weakness like that, that, you know, the people would treat you differently. And I see now that people are much more open about talking about these things. I think it's a really good positive thing. Definitely something that, that's changed uh, even in, in our lifetime. So yeah. that's, that's great. Um, what are you really excited about and kind of what are the next big things for you and, and maybe for, for Facebook if you care to talk about that? Yeah, I mean, I, the, the culture work, I, listen, I'm, I'm really lucky because I get to do the work. I mean, I, I, I am more excited about the opportunities now with Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and Messenger, you know, than I've ever been. And like, you know, people think, oh, well, it must have been so great in those early days. And, it, you know, this, it, was, it was a lot of hard work with a lot of, you know, you know, doubt around what this company was going to be and whether we were going to make it. You know, in the first four years of the company, it was like, you know, are we going to survive? Not are we going to become one of the 10 biggest companies in the world, right? It was like, you know, are we going to be around? Um, so I, I'm, it's great being now having a company with lots of great people. I mean, being one of the toughest transitions for us, you know, and I think as you guys think about starting your careers, is this transition from being a generalist to being a specialist. When you're in a small company, you're a generalist and you're working on a lot of different things. You know, as you grow, you become much more specialized in what you do and that's a very hard transition for people. And so for me, I always embrace that. I want to do less things better. And so, you know, there are people that, you know, that I just, you know, I, I really feel that I can, I'm contributing more when I'm doing more things. And as companies grow, there isn't, room for a lot of that.
doing fewer things better is also, in a way, a very Buddhist thing. So. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd rather just like, I love the culture work I'm doing right now. I love, you know, spending time with our teams around the world talking about what our values mean. I love talking to our partners, our commercial partners, about talking about our mission and why our mission matters and why our pursuit is a noble one. And being able to, to, to explain to people, like, if our ads aren't working for you, then you shouldn't spend another, you know, dime with us until we figure it out. And I think it's honestly, when you've been at the company as long as I have, and I can say to somebody, if I didn't believe fundamentally that what we're doing is right, then I wouldn't be here. That that's, you know, that's very honest, and people kind of understand that. So, so we're really very lucky to have you today, and you've had you know, a long career, very rich in a number of fields. Um, in the room today, we have a pretty varied audience. We have you know, students from, from different age groups. We have young graduates. We have less, uh, less, young, uh, less recent graduates. What would be... Less young. The, old, <laughs> the older graduates. Older graduates. <laughs> Uh, veteran graduates, um, what would be some of your advice uh, to people in the crowd and what would you have liked to have heard at maybe different stages in your life? Listen, I, you know, I found people that I believed in and I've worked for great people. I, you know, I've been really, I found, you know, I think early on I had this epiphany that, you know, I'm going to choose people to follow, right, whether or not they were my manager. And I was able to work for really good people and was able to kind of, you know, compartmentalize people that I was working with and for who I didn't believe in, or I didn't like the way they were treating other people. And there people I, who I completely respected from, a, from being big brains that understood business, but they, I didn't respect them from the way they were kind of treating others the way they did business. And so I think that, you know, again, finding those people that you can follow, I think is a great thing. I worked for Rupert Murdoch for a long time, and, you know, and James Murdoch, his son, was my intern, and he's been one of my great friends now for the last 25 years. And so I've been blessed working for really good, smart people. Yeah. Uh, working with, with wonderful people is maybe even more important than whatever I Yeah, and identifying is. people that you, you know, listen, this idea of mentorship. You know, I remember someone came to me, and a, a young woman who was working for me came to me, it was probably 1990. Five or 1996, I said, would you mentor me? I had no idea what she was talking about, right? I'm like, yeah, well, you already worked for me, you know? And she said, well, no, I really, so I'm thinking about my career beyond working, at, this is, I was working at News Corp at the time. I'm thinking about my career beyond News Corp, and like what I want to be. And I said, wow, that's, first of all, that's pretty interesting because generally you would never tell your boss that you didn't want to work there forever, right? And like, it's like, that was kind of interesting. And she said, no, like, this is my, I'm going to have a long career. It's not going to be a news corp forever. So I want to learn as much as I can learn. So I said, okay, so you, why don't you come sit in on meetings that you, can, that you want to, and I'd be happy to do it. Now, that woman, I've now been in, I've stayed in touch with, this was 1996. I talked to her once a month still. So, I mean, those are like amazing. So find someone to, 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 that you want to, to mentor you and ask them. And like she did, I think mentorship was, it was not something that people talked about a lot, you know, that, you know, 25 years ago, or whatever, 23 years ago. But, you know, it was, you know, now it's something that, you know, it's pretty common. And people reach out to me all the time and say, hey, so can you, would you spend some time talking to me about this? Or how do you, you know, I'm very big on vision writing. I believe you, if you write things down, you can manifest them to happen. So we talk a lot about that at Facebook, and I believe in that, you know, strongly as well. So I think if you're looking for somebody that, you know, that you want to help with your career, just ask. Well, some, some really great advice. And Matt, thank you very much for joining us today. It's really a pleasure to have you, and uh, we're very fortunate. Yeah, my pleasure to be here. Thank, thank you, you very much. All right, please join me. Matt Jacobson, everyone.